your people continue to trickle in, but we've got a lot of great stuff that we want to talk about you talk with you guys about today. So let's get started. My name is Brooke Vey. I am a health educator here at Healthy Lifestyles. I um, am presenting today with Sadie May and we have Jane Hansen with us today. We're so excited. I want to thank all of you for being here today and we're welcoming you back to the Beyond Weight Loss series. If this is your first time attending the Beyond Weight Loss class, just a quick little recap about what this series is all about. Our objective is to expose the fraud and deceit deceit of the diet industry. We want to introduce a sustainable perspective to health and wellness, and we want to help you feel empowered to engage in healthy behaviors regardless of weight loss. But most importantly, we want to shift the focus to what truly matters when it comes to health. In last week's class, Sadie talked about numbers versus health. We discussed the numbers that actually matter when focusing on your health. And if you're interested, we have the recording on our Healthy Lifestyles website. And so go check it out if you missed it. It was great. Today's class, we're going to be talking about media literacy and body dysmorphia. So how has the media influenced the way we think about ourselves and about our bodies? So can anyone tell me what they think this number of minutes represents? Any guesses? How often we think about our body, we have how much to work out per week, how long we're on social media daily, or how long it takes to burn a calorie. Awesome. Okay, so Hillary, you are the closest. So this 463 minutes is the amount the average consumer spends on some form of media through each day. So that's about 463 minutes, that's equivalent to seven and a half hours of our day or one third of our day spent consuming media. How crazy is that? With so much of our time spent consuming media, I think it's really important that we understand how it affects us as well as how can we become media literate. So Jane is going to talk to us a little bit about media literacy and what does it mean to be media literate? Thanks, Brooke. Um, when she shared that statistic with us, we were shocked. I mean, it really kind of puts into perspective the need for this discussion that we want to have today about, you know, media. If it's all around us, if we are going to cons consume it and it's inevitable, then we need to become media literate. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today and throughout the whole entire presentation. So hopefully um, by the end, you guys can feel a little bit more empowered and you can have some um, confidence leaving um, when you're consuming your media. So we want to talk about what types of media do we consume on a daily basis? So throw that into the chat. I'm going to um, insert that. So what types of media do you consume daily? TV, Facebook, TikTok, videos, YouTube, Pinterest, um, TikTok, local news, Instagram, Snapchat. Right. What about billboards when you're driving down I-15? And they're everywhere, right? That's media. Yeah. Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Outlook, Skim, Netflix, Hulu, Prime. Totally. Radio, commercials, TV shows, movies. Yes, it goes on and on and on. You guys have, have already, um, you know, highlighted just a few that, that, that you consume daily. Um, so, you know, these forms of media, ads, movies, shows, um, and the content that we're viewing daily, it's being engineered to make us feel and think a certain way. And I want you to think about that, you know, when you're consuming media, how 
does it make you feel? What does it make you want to consume? And, you know, is it trying to sell you something? What is it trying to sell you? Um, because it's, it is definitely trying to tug at your innermost desires so that you will buy or consume or become what they're trying to sell. Yeah, products and lifestyle, exactly. Um, okay, so we just want to we want to ask um, based on the content that you're viewing daily, how is it engineering you to make you feel? Excuse me, I have a sick little baby in the background. So if you hear extra coughing, that's why. <laughs> it's rather sad. Overwhelmed, not getting enough done in a day. Left wanting things, guilty, ugly, that I do not look good enough. Um, I need to do more for anti-aging, yeah. Jealous, a need to improve. It makes me feel I need to buy aging creams. Yeah. I want more than I need. You guys have, yeah, Nicole, all that I see is attainable, inadequate. Yeah. So these feelings, um, you know, they're, they're totally normal these these feelings that we're experiencing when we're consuming media and i think it's important that throughout this presentation and hopefully um you know at the end we will feel empowered to break down um the media content that we are consuming and be able to recognize with a different perspective with a protective lens that we will be able to um consume what makes us feel good, recognize the things that don't make us feel good and stop consuming them. Or, you know, we can still consume our guilty pleasures like keeping up with the Kardashians or, you know, the real housewives of Beverly Hills in my case, but still know that I have worth based off of who I am and what I give to the world. So if that makes sense to anyone, um, that's kind of what we're going to be ch chatting about a little bit today. But <clears throat> what emotions do you feel after you consume, you know, these types of media? Like you said, generally, these are negative. Um, so how we, can, how we can consume media that makes us feel positive, that makes us feel good. That's what we want to talk about. Because at the end of the day, we want to feel empowered with the things that we're viewing, you know. Um, whether they're TikTok videos that create us to, you know, I love that trend that says, I was today years old when I learned how to, you know, these are, these are informative videos that create easiness to our life. And media can do that for us. We can learn through media. We can um, it have a creative itch. Um, fulfilled when we're when we're consuming media so it can be definitely used for our good but we are in control of that and so um, based off of the types of media that we're consuming and the things that we're we're engaging in throughout social media or just you know movies um, TikTok videos the radio commercials billboards we can choose what's going to affect us so yeah, Brooke, you can you can take it away. No, oh, I really appreciate your comments, Jane, and and there's so much good that comes with media. It's been such a great uh, tool and resource, like you've said. But let's learn how to use it healthily. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's the purpose or the agenda behind um, lots of the media that we consume. So how many times, and you guys, a couple of you have mentioned this a bit, but how many times have you had the thoughts such as, I wish my lashes were longer, or I wish I had plumper lips, or I wish I didn't have those wrinkles on my forehead. I mean, I I think for the most part, we've all had a thought come 
into our mind one way or another uh, that's like that. But the media puts such a large amount of pressure on individuals, especially females, to meet a certain social and cultural standard of beauty, which can inevitably lead to poor body image or body dysmorphia. The more an individual is exposed to this unrealistic standard, the more they find it's reflective of how they believe they should look. Looking youthful and thin, but curvy in all the right places has become an essential part of what it means to be beautiful by today's standards. These standards are often unachievable, especially as we age and mature. They can lead to us feeling negative about our bodies and potentially experience more severe issues such as anxiety, depression, obsession with losing weight, and a distorted view of how we look at our bodies. So the widespread of media, it makes it very challenging for almost anyone to avoid evaluating themselves against the socio-culture standard of beauty in some way or other. Therefore, we have these thoughts of, I wish, or I'll be happy when, or if only I had her face, you know? I mean, who is the first person to say that having wrinkles and aging is a bad thing? Or that we need to have perfectly smooth, unblemished skin all the time in order to look beautiful? The problem is, we don't see any of these attributes positively portrayed in the media. The majority of the time, if we see an older woman, her wrinkles and blemishes are magically gone, or when we don't, and basically when we don't see them, uh, these attributes positively portrayed, we begin to create a negative association with these said attributes. And so the media industry, they capitalize on our wishful thinking and our desires to reach these beauty benchmarks. They create problems that need fixing and only by purchasing a certain product or a certain treatment can you attain that beauty benchmark. So I just wanted to share a quick story I um, about an experience I had with this. So I was just a few weeks postpartum with my baby. I was first time mom and it, any of you moms who have been there, you know how overwhelming it can be. There's a lack of sleep. There's a learning curve you're going through. You're just trying to keep your baby alive and yourself alive and try and enjoy it all in the same moment. It's beautiful, crazy, experience <laughs> all wrapped into one and I had I actually had a couple of friends reach out to me on social media and they said hey you know congrats on having your baby we're super excited for you I'm sure you know that you know after you have a baby you experience postpartum hair loss and you know that's never fun you you want to have thick beautiful hair so buy this shampoo I'm selling the shampoo if you buy it it's gonna help all your hair grow back it'll be lush and beautiful like you never had a baby you know it's it's just right back to the way it was before. And I had to take a step back and I, my appearance and the way I look those first few weeks after having a baby was the last thing that was on my mind. I wasn't thinking about hair loss or the way I looked. I was focused on, again, trying to keep my baby alive and, and keep myself functioning. And, and I, the, created this problem that I didn't even know or had thought of had existed, but they come in, um, reach out on social media and they bring this problem up and say, you know, I can fix this problem for you, but you just got to buy my product. And, you know, and this is exactly what the media does, whether it's in ads or commercials or, again, a friend who's trying to sell you something, there's this problem that they create themselves. So I'd like to do um, a quick activity. We're gonna, I'm gonna have you look at a commercial of your, and we, I want you to tell me what's the problem that they're creating and how are they trying to solve it? Baby, baby, I'll not win the day. 
can anyone tell me what is the problem that they are creating here? We have shame or guilt. We all have flaws that need to be covered up. They're saying that being confident requires perfect skin and implying you can't have that without wearing makeup. Your makeup could wear off during the day that you have to have foundation on for 24 hours. We should all look like that all the time. You need their makeup to feel confident. Exactly. I mean, you guys all, you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, you think about who wears makeup for 24 hours. I'd love to know, you know, who feels like they need foundation, concealer, you're going to bed at night. You want that stuff to stay on. I mean, I, it's just kind of crazy to me that they, um, you know, you make you feel like you need to have this perfect skin 24 hours a day you need to cover up those blemishes and only then can you be confident in yourself only then when your flaws again are covered up can you feel confident so they're creating this problem and therefore providing you with a solution um what are some initial feelings that you felt did you did you feel like, I mean, they're sitting there, they're dancing, they're having a great time. Everyone's smiling. They're happy. Do you, are you like, yeah, I want to be just like them. Like, I want to feel that good. I want to be that happy. And, oh, well, that makeup's going to help me do that. Or do you take a step back and you're like, mm, I don't like the message they're sharing. Or I don't feel super great about that. We and have um, a comment that's kind of the opposite. Like, it made me like it, right? Because it was happy, it was fun, right? So it makes you it maybe create something even positive within you. But they do it while trying to portray the brand as inclusive. I noticed that. So um, it was very inclusive with people of color, but there wasn't very inclusive with body size or age, right? Or even gender. Who's to say that we can't, men don't wear makeup? Totally. Mm hmm. There's absolutely no way I could ever look like them. It shames you. Someone said, I enjoyed the commercial. So, yeah, so I think that's interesting that people are bringing that up, that it made me feel feel good, right? So, probably when I go to Estee Lauder section of the grocery store, I may, you know, pick out that brand because it made you feel good. Totally. And, and again, here's the thing. It's coming across these ads and they're inevitable. I mean, if you watch any sort of streaming service, any sort of television, these makeup ads, they're popping up everywhere. I mean, again, and it's not just makeup ads, but it's any ad in general. And uh, it's just, you know, how can we be aware of how these ads are affecting us and tuning into ourselves and what is the message that they're trying to say? Being able to think critically about what um, what's being uh, what's being sold. And I think I mean we're in a class right now, so we're thinking critically about it. Um, and you know, you know, this is coming from healthy lifestyles, so you're probably thinking, okay, I need to watch this with a critical eye. But that's not necessarily what it's like when you're just sitting on your couch, right? Or um, you guys are professionals working in the community, but you could see how these messages could also affect youth and create insecurities just early in life, just because they're figuring it out. And this is what's being told is natural. What's they're saying what's natural is to wear makeup that lasts for 24 hours. Very right, contradicting. Right. So I just want to put my two cents in as well, because I agree with <clears throat> what has been shared. Um, I also think it's important when, you know, we're consuming these types of messages um, just to be like, like, I, I'm, my name is Jane and I'm very much a plain Jane. I wear very minimal amounts of makeup and I'm confident with that. That's not something that I, like, I feel comfortable and confident in my skin. Um, 
but growing up, it wasn't always that it wasn't always the case. I'm fair and I have a lot of freckles. And, um, when I would wear cover up, my freckles would disappear. And that was, that's a big part of who I am. And so for myself, um, you know, you feel like this internal disconnect of, well, the world tells me that I, I need to wear this in order to um, cover up blemishes or cover up my, my face, but that's who I am. And so, you know, you have to do what makes you feel confident. And, you know, if a commercial or an ad makes you feel good and you want to consume that product, good. I'm glad that it did that for you. That's awesome. But if you have questions or if it's making you feel um, uncomfortable or, you know, you have, it's going against what you who you are or what you do or what you feel, that's okay. You don't have to consume the product. And so I think that's where media literacy comes into play is just feeling, yeah, okay. Like I don't have to consume it and it doesn't make me any less of a human being or any less beautiful or desirable or relevant or important because you do have worth regardless of whether or not you wear makeup. Oh, thank you so much for sharing, Jane. I really appreciate your comments. And again, it's, and that's what we, the, the point of this whole class is. So we want you to be able to look at these forms of media and discern for yourself. Okay, is this healthy? Is this making me feel good and confident? Or is it detracting from my own self-worth and my own, um, how I view myself? So thank you so much for that. Um, now that we've kind of talked a little bit about, oops, <laughs> about how our, the, you know, what's the media's agenda and how they like to, sorry, let me get this pulled up again. <laughs> and while you're getting pulled up, it makes me think about yeah. how they target certain commercials during certain shows. It kind of makes me mad. I mean, they would probably show Estee Lauder commercial, right? Yeah, it's certain things that we were talking about, like the Real Housewives or whatever. And then when we are watching Super Bowl, you know, it's trucks and it's beer, right? And so they're making this, and I am a huge football fan. I am a huge, um, you know, sports fan. And you can definitely see who they're trying to target. And so you, if you grew up with these messages, you've, Feel like they're putting you into a category either based on age gender sexual orientation or whatever it may be and trying to fit us into these molds when there is so much crossover in our world and that's what makes the world beautiful but with media they're pigeonholing us let's take it with what you will but yeah. i just find that fascinating oh totally again it's they know exactly what they're doing they know exactly how to engineer um, this, and they have all sorts of different tactics in order to, you know, get to that audience that's going to buy the product the most. And so I'm actually going to talk a little bit about how it's a perfect segue into ways that they, the tools that they use to influence us. So one of the most popular ways that the media influences us is by using celebrities, influencers, people who are close to us and who we look up to, to try and sell us these products and these ideals. Marketers know that if we see those people who we aspire to be using certain products and services, then we're gonna wanna use them too and therefore we'll feel a degree of identification with them. And therefore they pour billions and billions of dollars into recruiting these influential people for campaigns. And you think, okay, if they're putting billions of dollars into these campaigns, they must be making hundreds of billions, you know, in revenue. So this last year it was estimated that $13.8 billion was used in influencer marketing. And that number is expected to reach just over 15 billion this next year. So I, I was a little curious and I was like, you know, how, how do these influencers, how do these people get paid and what's kind of 
goes into that. So depending on a person, how many followers a person has, the type of engagement they get, the brand they portray, it all determines how much they get paid. But I came across a chart uh, that shows the average amount of how much a person can make per Instagram post, depending on the number of followers that they have. So for nano influencers, someone with one to five, what done to ten thousand you can get anywhere from ten dollars to a hundred ten to a, a micro influencer gets a hundred to five hundred a mid influencer that's five hundred to a thousand a macro we've got five thousand to ten thousand and a mega influencer so someone who has a million plus can receive anywhere upwards of ten thousand dollars and how crazy is that? Just think about that. They are taking a picture of themselves with the product and writing up a caption and posting it. And they are making, you know, tons and tons of money off of that. And a lot of times too, yes, Lauren, that's um, money per post. And so, you know, they can post anywhere from a few times a week and they're, <laughs> yeah, Mary, I think I'm in the wrong line of work too. <laughs> But, you know, they can do a couple of these sponsored ads and posts per week, you know, and so they're making, you know, say you're a mid influencer, even if that you can be making anywhere from one to two grand per post and say you're posting three times a week. That's, you know, anywhere from six to ten grand in a week. How insane is that? And in doing some more digging and research, it kind of, you know, the reason that people buy from influencers and from celebrities is because they trust their opinion. They feel, again, this sort of relatability in that, hey, I identify with you because I follow along with you in your day-to-day -day life and you share your life with me and, and I feel connected to you. And therefore, whatever you tell me you like, I'm going to want to buy that. I'm going to trust you and your product. But what happens is a lot of times these marketing companies that are trying to, again, sell their product, they are writing these captions for them. They are sending out a script and saying, you have to say this, this, and this in order to get paid, um, um, in order to get paid and, you know, basically rave about this product. And if you do that, then we'll send you the money. So again, it's not even, I mean, I'm not going to say all the time, but majority of the time, it's not even this person's genuine thoughts and opinions about said product. It's, again, something that's being <laughs> scripted for them. So I did a little, I was, you know, I was just completely fascinated by this topic and I was, you know, wondering who's the most followed person on Instagram. And so we have... Uh, Cristiano Ronaldo is the most popular, most followed person on Instagram, and he has 400 and, oh, sorry, 483 million followers. How crazy is that? He, and he makes an average of $1.6 million per post. 1.6 I mean, can you can you just wrap your head around that for a little bit, please? I mean, granted, he is probably one of, if not the most uh, well-known football players of his time. And he is very successful, but he has a very broad reach. He, his influence reaches across the world. And advertisers know this and they know that people who want who look up to him who aspire to be like him little kids adults you know everyone they are going to listen to what he has to say and um they are going to use products as i mentioned they want to identify him with him so they're going to buy products that he talks about and so i looked at some of his sponsored posts we have the theragun a massage gun we have a grocery delivery service there's nike um a video game there was even i couldn't believe it was a it's called the Inspreya clinic it's a hair growth clinic i mean would you ever think that this professional football player would need help with hair growth i mean i i don't know you know it's 
you know, if but if he's talking about it, if he's promoting it, well, then I as a man or, you know, anyone can feel like I can go to this hair growth clinic. And if he can, I can, too. And I'm sure, you know, these companies are just raking in hundreds of millions of dollars just from his one little ad and his little blurb. So they're they're these they're called influencers for a reason. <laughs> Um, another tactic that advertisers use is that they want to use products that they advertise these products as being highly desirable and that they're going to bring you happiness. And I just wanted to share, I couldn't believe when I was driving down I-15 yesterday or not yesterday, a few days ago, and I didn't get a picture of it, but I saw this billboard and it said diamonds were a girl's best friend until Botox came along. And it just blew my mind. I could not believe that, you know, this is what is being promoted out there. This is what's being sold is, you know, forget about diamonds, whatever. You don't need them. You need Botox. And Botox is what's going to be your new best friend. It's going to hide all those, dare I say, wrinkles and blemishes on your face. And once it does that, then you can feel confident in your appearance. And here's the thing. This isn't, this wasn't just one billboard that I had seen along the way. It the whole, our, our freeways, I-15, it's littered with billboards just like this, talking about different cool sculpting treatments, thinning, um, I see someone in the chat put uh, lips, you know, fillers, face fillers. For men, you see stuff about ED all the time, you know, it's mm -hmm. nobody is safe <laughs> when it comes to uh, these forms of advertising. They want you to believe, like, you can be happy. You just need this treatment. Again, it's creating this problem and providing you with their fix. It's just absolutely wild. <laughs> but the thing is, is you know, it they would it didn't work, and mm -hmm. and they know that, so they they continue to do it. And maybe you're sitting here thinking, well, I don't pay attention to those billboards anyway. I'm just, you know, on my commute, I go there, I come back. They don't really have an effect on me. But here's the thing is that advertisers, they, the influence of advertising, it's quick, it's cumulative. And for the most part, it's subconscious. So even though you may think that you just passed by, you don't think it, it's still there and it sits in your subconscious, whether you like it or not. And, you know, maybe you're sitting in the grocery store and you're like, where have I seen that product before? Well, it was probably in a ad that you weren't paying attention to, or it was probably on a billboard that you drove past, but didn't think you were paying attention to. And again, these advertisers know that all you need to do is just see it. You don't necessarily need to be paying attention to it and it'll sit in your subconscious. And so I want to share a little clip from a TED talk and it's called The Dangerous Ways That Ads See Women. And it's by a woman named Jean Kilborn. And we will. Many ways we've obviously come a long way. But from my perspective of over 40 years, the image of women in advertising is worse than ever. The pressure on women to be young, thin, beautiful is more intense than ever before. It's always been impossible. Years ago, the supermodel Cindy Crawford said, I wish I looked like Cindy Crawford. She couldn't, of course, no one can look like this, but it's really impossible today because of the magic of Photoshop, which can turn this woman into this woman and then try to make us believe that an anti-aging cream can do this. Now, she's a beautiful woman, but older women are considered attractive in our culture only insofar as we stay looking impossibly young. We learn to read men's and women's faces very differently. Here we have Brad Pitt and former supermodel Linda Evangelista, about the same age, each one of them in an ad for Chanel, but he gets to look like a human being, and she's transformed into a cartoon. Now, sometimes, every now and then, a celebrity resists. And as you may know, just this week, Lord sent out a tweet with an unretouched photograph below the Photoshop version. 
and she tweeted, remember, flaws are okay. Good for her, but this doesn't happen very often. Men are photoshopped too, but when men are photoshopped, they're made bigger. Andy Roddick laughed when he saw the bulked up arms on this cover photo and suggested they should be returned to the man they belong to. <clears throat> the obsession with thinness is worse than ever because of Photoshop. Her head is bigger than her pelvis. This is an anatomical impossibility. The actual model for this ad was fired for being too fat and they used Photoshop to create this freakish image. More recently, they used Photoshop to remove the dreaded thigh gap. Unfortunately, they also removed a very important part of her body. So the image is impossible for everyone, but particularly for women of color, who are considered beautiful only insofar as they resemble the white ideal. Light skin, straight hair, Caucasian features, round eyes, even Beyonce's skin is lightened in ads. The image isn't real. It's artificial, it's constructed, it's impossible. But real women and girls measure ourselves against it every single day. Does anyone have any thoughts about what she had to say? We have everything she said was true. That's very disgusting. We are targets. Brad Pitt gets to be human stayed with me. Totally. I mean, it just, it kind of gives you goosebumps just thinking about, you know, the media, again, they know exactly what they're doing. They know how to manipulate you, how to get you to think a certain way and feel a certain way. And there is a hundred percent this double standard when it comes to age, when it comes to the way a person should look, when it comes to, you know, again, the color of your skin. She touched on the white ideals of, you know, you and it's just it's very as someone said it's disturbing <laughs> and you know the the media these fake um sorry the media uses photoshop facetune and tons of other editing tools to create this ideal yet unattainable beauty standards and they're just going to keep pumping you with that to get you to keep buying their products so that in hopes one day you will look just like these, you know, so-called normal people or celebrities or, you know, whatever it is. So I have another clip here that just, it goes to show just how powerful uh, the Photoshop tool is. Anyone else's mind just completely blown after watching that? Do we have any thoughts about um, that video? Yuck, yeah. <laughs> Super creepy. It's kind of crazy, huh? That this tool can turn a piece of pizza into some skinny, thin, perfect looking model. Cindy says it's kind of cool how technology has come so far, but again, there's great, there's great pros of, of technology, what we can do and, and how it can be utilized, but 
it's unfortunate that many people have used it for um, not so great things. You know, they, they don't use it to help um, help grow in um, a person's body image and how they feel. They, they use it to break you down just to get you to buy their product and to make more money. And I, you know, Jane had said too, I, I, I want to say thank you to everyone who's been commenting in the chat. We've been having lots of great discussion and it's, um, I appreciate everyone sharing their experiences. Um, so these fake and unrealistic body images that are shared throughout the media, they lead to dis a distorted perception of our own bodies, otherwise known as body dysmorphia. Uh, Lyndon says she's shocked how many cosmetic surgery places um, she's noticed while driving around. There's tons here in Utah. We see it all the time. And again, when these... Um, when these places are populated everywhere, when they're talked about by everyone you see, they it gets you um, doing some self-reflecting yourself. And you're like, well, if you're getting it, you look the way that you do, do, does that mean I need to do it? And it distorts your image of your own body and how you feel about yourself. And so I wanna talk a little bit about this distorted body image and specifically body dysmorphia. So the Mayo Clinic defines body dysmorphia as a mental health condition in which you can't stop thinking about one or more perceived flaws in your appearance. This flaw can be so minor and unseen by others, however, it can leave you feeling embarrassed, ashamed, anxious, so much so that you'll want to avoid social situations, um, dressing a certain way, acting a certain way, because this perceived flaw is so significant. And it um, it causes significant distress and it impacts your ability to function in your daily life. I mean, how many of us have had some flaw or thing about ourselves that we just fixate on and we just think, everything's fixed. It'll, like, I will feel good about myself and I will feel better. And it's just, it's not the case, you know, but again, we've been engineered to think a certain way. There mm -hmm. was a study that was published by the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, and they found that the influence of mass media is associated with a greater probability of adolescents presenting body dysmorphia. So this isn't ourselves as grown adults, this is young girls and children who, this is starting at a very young age, they're targeting young girls and they're getting them into this mindset at a young age. So as they continue to grow, they're gonna continue to buy these products. They're gonna continue to buy into these ideals that are being promoted everywhere. They also found that when these adolescents were exposed to the media, what happens was they internalized these patterns of physical beauty, beauty, and that is what resulted in dissatisfaction of their own bodies. And they also found that some of these adolescents had an increased risk of developing eating disorders. So why are they developing these eating disorders? It's because they're trying to find that quick fix to fix that perceived flaw. So they're going to seek out, and again, this is anyone in general now, in order to attain that ideal body, you're going to seek out cosmetic procedures like we talked about earlier. They're everywhere here in Utah. We're going to partake in maybe some unhealthy diet. Um, that's the new craze. Uh, there's these eating disorders that lots of young women and older women uh, fall into. And we're going to do these things to try and find that happiness. But what happens is this, you know, maybe it brings some temporary satisfaction and a reduction to the distress that you feel because of this perceived flaw. But more often than not, it's going to cause damage. It's going to have your anxiety will return and you're going to resume trying to find ways to fix that perceived flaw. And so how can we treat this? How can we make it better? You know, if you start to see yourself experiencing any of these thoughts or behavior patterns, it's important to seek proper health and treatment and to visit with your primary care physician. 
and talk with them about it. You know, maybe it's not as serious as, um, you know, having an eating disorder or whatever it is, but your primary care physician should be having your best interest at heart. And they're gonna wanna help you find the help and treatment that you're in need of. And, you know, if you don't feel comfortable talking to your primary care physician about these thoughts that you're having, or um, you start to recognize then maybe it's time to find a different primary care physician. You should um, be comfortable enough to talk openly and feel like you can you can um, talk about anything and receive uh, that they're going to have your best interests at heart and that they're going to help you receive the best treatment that you need. So, you know, and that's if you're kind of in the thick of it. But how can we prevent ourselves? from having these thoughts, having these harmful um, thoughts about ourselves, especially when it comes to consuming media. Because as I mentioned earlier, it's impossible to avoid. It's everywhere. So I'm gonna turn the time over to Jane uh, to talk a little bit about a few tips we can use to process and critique the media, and that can help us from having these thoughts before they get too serious. Thanks, Brooke. This is important stuff. And um, when we become critical viewers of media, it's it's important for us to be kind to ourselves, um, especially when we're talking about body dysmorphia um, and how media can, can contribute to these feelings. But really, it's important that we recognize that all media images and messages are all um, constructions. Right, they're they're not um, they're not reflections of our reality. Um, advertise, advertisements are created to do one thing for us to buy or support a product or a service. And um, advertisers they they create their messages based on what they think you want to see, what and what will compel you to buy their their product. Um, I also think it's important that we recognize as individuals, we get to decide, we get to choose the experience we are going to have with social media, with just media, radio, TV, just any sort of media that we consume in general. We get to choose how it affects us. And if it's affecting us in a negative way, then we need to put our protective lenses on and be mindful about what types of media we're consuming. And this is all from the, the National Eating Disorder Association. So, so these facts, um, you know, tips, I should say tips for becoming a critical viewer, um, they are all about, they're from uh, accredited source. So keep that in mind. Um, and moving on here, just some tips to, to provide for media self-care is to choose and use media mindfully. Absolutely 100%. You know, smartphones and tablets and screens, they are so helpful and so awesome. But if you feel like they are, they are taking away from your joy and thriving at life, Put some limitations on those for yourself, just so that you can um, enjoy being in the present moment. Be mindful. Put your screen down and go for a walk. You know, get some vitamin D. Um, it's so important for your overall health and wellness. Limit screen time and social networking. Test the message for body positivity. I love this. Advocate for your body. Advocate for the beauty and not the fact that it's it should be just looked at, but that it it can do incredible things. And Sadie's going to talk a lot about that next, so I don't want to take up too much time here. But I just want to really encourage you to change the narrative, change the perspective. You have that power. And it's incredible, you know, if someone that you love and admire is is being 
hateful or mean or unsatisfied with who they are maybe that person is yourself maybe that person is a partner or a spouse or a child or a mother or a father or a sister or a brother what whoever it is whoever's close to you really talk to them about their character talk to them about who they are build them up and you know that advocate for body positive talk and um you know how they make you feel as a person how grateful you are for them to be in your life we could talk about this forever and ever and that's why we're doing the beyond weight loss series because it's so much more so much so much more so that's all for me but i'm gonna turn the time over to sadie because she's gonna talk about how to stop the culture of self objectification and it is beautiful and empowering so um, sadie it's all you all right so this next section is inspired by the book more than a body it was written by twins Lindsay and lexi kite and it's a great resource to teach people how to develop a positive body image um, through unique and research backed framework so if you want to use the Salt Lake County Library to download or listen to More Than a Body, we highly recommend it. So they discuss this phenomenon that occurs when ingesting just large amounts of media, and it's called self-objectification, which means people treat themselves or see themselves as objects to be viewed and evaluated based on their appearance. So the authors describe it as being in an invisible prison of picturing yourself being looked at instead of fully living. So in addition to this rise in social media, the pandemic has also created an unprecedented demand for cosmetic surgery. Um, lots of patients have said that they are tired of looking at their video images during meetings and they're calling this the Zoom boom. It's a nationwide spike in cosmetic surgeries, and they're even calling it Zoom dysmorphia. So self-objectification that we do in the mirror, that we do in our own, looking at ourselves in pictures, um, or that we do even on Zoom or WebEx, it minimizes us, it distracts us from what's important, and it drains our energy. So when addressing or treating a culture of self-objectification or Zoom dysmorphia, we can do this in many different ways. And Jane had touched on some earlier when viewing media. Um, we're gonna touch about how to do them and how to do it internally. So the first thing that we can do is stop negative self-talk that happens in our minds. I know that's easier said than done, but finding what moments, what experiences when you start to have negative self-talk about your appearance and becoming critical of that, putting yourself on trial and why am I thinking this? What, what has created, what environment has been created for me to think this way about myself and catching yourself and changing the channel in your brain and moving on. So positive self-talk is correlated with an increase of lifespan, lower rate of depression, greater resilience to illness, better concentration, and better resilience to stress. And sometimes when we are actually going through times of stress, whether it's at work, with our families, caregiving, whatever it may be, we start to focus on what we look like. And that is just, it's really, kind of a tell as old as time, right? It seems to be something we think we can control because the media has put it out there that we can with their products, that we can change that. But finding yourself when you're doing negative self-talk and switching that channel, like I said, or if it's easier for you to actually write down your negative thoughts in a journal and then going back to them and switching the narrative. So some examples I have is if you were saying, I hate my blank or I don't like this and you find yourself doing that throughout the day, writing it down and maybe switching it to, well, I am so grateful for my legs. They get me, they take me on long, beautiful hikes that I enjoy. 
or if you're seeing commercials and your brain thinks I've never have, I'll never have that, right? We had some people in the chat say it just it seems so unattainable, it's overwhelming. But switching the narrative in our mind to my body allows me to do all the things that I love. So live by the rule that if you wouldn't say something to a good friend or to a child, stop saying it to yourself. So that leads into my next tip for stopping self-objectification and that's gratitude and positive affirmations. And more than a body reiterates the importance of practicing gratitude and seeing your body as an instrument and not an ornament, meaning giving thanks for what your body can do, not what it looks like. So you can repeat personal mantras or come up with personal affirmations that are um, helpful for you. Some examples I have is, my body is a vessel for life, or my body is a gift, or if you find yourself being negative, to switch it to, I choose to do and say things that are kind about myself. It sounds cheesy, and I know if you go to an elementary school, these mantras are everywhere, right? There's inspirational quotes on posters and everything, because when we start to counterbalance all the media messages that are creating a problem or creating flaws in our brain. If we have these mantras to counterbalance them, we can kind of tone out that loud noise with the media. I have a couple more just to finish this up in these last three minutes it is give to others. Studies show that giving to your community can improve your overall wellness and give you a bigger sense of purpose. It reduces stress, improves your mood, can increase your self-esteem and happiness. It can also decrease blood pressure and promote a longer life. So experts even say that performing just small acts of kindness can make you more optimistic and a positive person and to feel good about yourself. The next one I have for you is therapy. It is extremely normal to struggle with negative body image and you may need extra help with dealing with that. So here are some signs of when you should reach out to a therapist for body image issues. And some of them are being preoccupied with flaws or things that you perceive as flaws, feeling uncomfortable in your own body if you feel shame or disgust in relation to your appearance, if you're comparing yourself to other people, or if you're comparing yourself to your past self, right? We've had Facebook, Instagram for over a decade now. And so it's very easy to go back 10 years and see what you look like. And people spend a lot of time comparing to what they used to look like, not remembering they probably used Photoshop on a couple things, right? And um, so if you find yourself getting preoccupied with those thoughts, it may be helpful to reach out to a therapist. If you're becoming obsessed with the number on the scale, with BMI, with body fat percentage, and doing any means necessary to like extreme dieting or skipping meals or those types of things, that is a time to reach out to a therapist. And the County Deer Oaks EAP program offers six free counseling sessions per year. And that's definitely something that can help you if needed. All right, the last two I have, this one may seem, um, it may seem weird, right? It's, it's all about compliments and giving meaningful compliments. Your typical reaction after going to a discussion or a workshop like this on body image is to go out and tell everybody how beautiful they are and to build their confidence because it breaks your heart that so many people suffer from body dysmorphia. And we've all engaged in giving body based compliments, but just steering away from that compliments regarding appearance can actually be feeding into this system and the society that what you look like matters in any sort of way. Like, right? We're just feeding into this. Uh, we seem to go on the other side of the spectrum when it comes to body dysmorphia and talk about body positivity and loving everything about yourself, which is great but you're still putting so much emphasis on your body and what it looks like being important when we should come to the middle with body neutrality and just live our lives. So we encourage you to give compliments to people based on their personality, based on their work ethic or how they make you feel rather than what they look like. Okay, everybody, the last one I have for you is being whole. 
So bringing yourself back to being one whole person rather than being who you are on the inside and then being the person that you think people see on the outside, but just being one, being one whole person and prioritizing how you feel and what you do over what you look like. We will stay on if you have any other questions and we put the sign in link in the chat box. But we will see you next week on May 3rd. We're going to have a dietitian from St. Mark's Hospital talk about weight loss myths. Thanks for joining you guys.